I do not embrace that at all. Uh, I don't embrace it because one, that is the, the, the data even used for that is more of a governmental uh, term for that. It's not based on what's actually happening on the ground in our community. And even as you look at comparisons to other cities throughout the New Orleans making national headlines as the murder capital of the U.S. Absolutely. Metropolitan Crime Commission says per capita homicides are higher than every other city in the United States. Tonight, New Orleans is a city in crisis. Police are looking for leads. Extremely violent crime wave. The teenage boy is now dead. Shot and killed overnight. Dubbed the murder capital of the country. The murder rate in New Orleans has already surpassed last year's and the negativity that comes with the killings, once again, making national headlines. WDSU reporter Gina Swanson explains that the bad publicity comes at a time when people all across America are keeping a close eye on what's happening here in the Crescent City. 183 murders so far this year. It's extremely disturbing. Uh, there's a new murder capital of the United States. New Orleans now leads the nation in murders per capita, more than St. Louis, more than Baltimore, the two cities that topped the list in 2021. There have been more than 200 homicides so far this year in the Big Easy. That's up more than 140% since 2019. Now, according to one international advocacy group, if the violence continues, New Orleans would rank ninth in the world in murders among cities that are not at war. Now that I have your attention, I think it's pretty safe to say that the original Hot Boys, made up of John Bryant, Sterling Lofton, Stephen Anthony Joseph, Alton Patterson, and Terrence Williams, weren't a gang at all. Sure, they ran together and pulled off acts, but identifying them as a gang would be a bit of a reach. As they often ran in pairs, that's when one of them wasn't locked up on a drug, pistol, or homicide charge. For those who don't seem to understand the term gang, let's put it into proper perspective perspective by P.P. Webster's definition of the word gang. Gang, a group of persons working together to unlawful or antisocial ends, especially a band of antisocial adolescents. A group of persons working together, a group of persons having informal and usually close social relations. Gangs used in a sentence, watching TV with the gang. Gang, a set of articles. Gang, a combination of similar implements or devices arranged for convenience to act together. Let's dive in to the FBI's definition of a gang. Gang, a group who share a common identity, who generally engage in criminal behavior and or activity. An association of three or more individuals whose members collectively identify themselves by adopting a group identity, which they use to create an atmosphere of fear and intimidation, frequently by employing one or more of the following. A common name, slogan, identifying gang sign, identical tattoos, or other physical markings. Lastly, style and color of clothing. The overall consensus is that the purpose of a street gang is largely in part to engage in criminal activity, which uses violence or intimidation to further its criminal objectives. It is this definition that the feds would use to build cases and hit dudes up 
with a RICO. However, there is no consensus on the exact definition of a gang as it has been debated for years whether the definition should expressly include involvement in criminal activity. Some gangs, but not all, have strong leadership, formalized rules, and extensive use of common identifying symbols. There are many gangs that associate themselves with a particular geographic area, hoods, sets, streets, and cities. Youths and adults have formed groups, usually within their own age bracket, from the beginning of human history. Some groups engage in what would be described as normal or socially acceptable behaviors. Other groups, however, may engage in behaviors that are harmful or even criminal. Youth gangs have existed since at least the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe. In the United States, gangs have existed since at least the Revolutionary Era. As the number of youth gangs will slowly increase in American cities, certain characteristics will remain intact. Gangs were typically organized along ethnic or racial lines. The time spent in a gang was generally restricted to one's youth as some former gang members would later mature and move into the mainstream workforce, aka get a real job. The notion that New Orleans doesn't have gangs and never has is absolutely ludicrous. Beginning in the 1980s, gangs in the United States would take on a new focus. They would be far more violent than in the past as the primary motive of turf protection was replaced with the goal of obtaining wealth through control of the illegal drug trade. Gang culture exists through the entire country country, no matter the opinion or rhetoric of individuals, with gangs such as Crips, Bloods, GDs, BDs, and Latin Kings, just to name a few, all having order and structure. In this video, we're going to take a look at several group of men from New Orleans who the Fed would consider as gangs. The Melfamine Projects, officially called the Gustavo Apartments or the Gus Homes, is a housing complex located in the Central City neighborhood of New Orleans. The Melf, constructed in 1964, occupies 10 city blocks, founded by South Robinson, Clio, Simon Boulevard, and Martin Luther King. There will be four three-story buildings and two four-story buildings for families and a high-rise for the elderly. Being 12 stories tall, the Gus High-Rise is the tallest public housing complex in the city. The MELF, once made up of single multi-family homes, by the 1950s, the city declared the MELF as the slums, which paved the way for the build of the projects. The MELF will be the youngest surviving housing projects in New Orleans. The high-rise will undergo major renovations in 2002. In the 1980s and the 1990s, the MELF was well known for that work as it was once run over by steppers and hustlers. In 2004, three of six low-rise buildings will be demolished after failing to meet the Housing Authority of New Orleans economic guidelines. In 2006, the MELF will be one of the only projects in the city that survived Hurricane Katrina with minimal wind damage and no flooding. The last building will be demolished in 2013. Reconstruction will begin in the same year at a cost of $61 million through the use of $26 million from Hano, $21.3 million from FEMA, and $13.1 million in low-income housing credits. Gibbs Construction and Clomax Construction will complete the development of the new one, two, three, and four bedroom unit, which include energy star appliances, which would also be pre-wired for cable and internet services. The new Gus Homes would open in 2018 with 638 homes located on the entire Gus site, 577 of which are public housing units. The story starts in the MELF, former home to matriarch Miss Meliza, mother of Brenda and Michelle Keelan, aka Missy, off the MLK side of the MELF. Passion Cobbins will grow up in the MELF with the men who she would take the stand on in 2017. Coined as the First Lady, Passion will spill on the men who we now know today as YMM. Passion will go on to testify that the men moved work and crushed their ops. Claiming to have witnessed one crushing and having extensive knowledge of four more, Passions will go on to testify that YMM would brag about spending the bin. Passion, who dropped out in 11th grade, did hair in the project and would be on the set with YMM. 25 at the time of the trial, Passion will give full details on the crushing of Deshaun Hartford. 
passion with a ledge that Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Lot, will pull out two blicks, push her to the ground, and smash the Sean Hartford. Passion, who was arrested herself on unrelated aggravated assault charges in July of 2014, wouldn't be done. She will go on to testify that in 2012, Titty would delete Vinnie Smith, a.k.a. Funk. YMM would believe that Funk was playing both sides of the field with the one tenors. Passion would state that during the reign of YMM, she and her former boyfriend, Jacoby Boyd, a.k.a. Cole of YMM, who was sentenced to 40 years for crushing Travis Thomas on I-10, were like Bonnie and Clyde. The Rick, Jawan, Brian, and Delwin would all be convicted following a seven-day trial. Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Lot, would be tagged with the leader role of YMM. YMM was allegedly formed in or about 2005 and will continue to exist through 2014. It was rumored that YMM controlled the Central City Territory up and down Martin Luther King by the mouth. YMM would allegedly participate in a wide range conspiracy to pump that hard in Central City. A long-standing feud between the one tenors and YMM would be in place. Coming up in the mouth, members of the Allen family and YMM would have blood and street ties. Three members of the one tenors will be convicted on January 29th of 2015 in Orleans Parish Criminal Court for the Brianna Allen occurrence. Absolutely, Camille. And as you can understand, this is a moment the families of Brianna Allen and Shawana Pierce have been waiting for since that May 29th, 2012, when the suspects were accused of opening fire with an AK-47. Well, now the jury has spoken. All three convicted all charges. Now, this is a trial that has stretched on for just about three weeks now. Uh, the prosecutors allege that not only did the, sus the convicted people in this case open fire, Allen and Shawana Pierce, the prosecutors also say that they were involved in an uptown gang that funneled and weapons throughout the city. That's why they also faced a racketeering charge. They were found guilty on that as well. Guilty on all counts in the indictment except for one of the lesser charges. Now, this was an emotional time for the family. In the courtroom, you could see tears streaming down the faces. You can see people hunched over, sobbing, wondering if this is a day that would ever come. One of the suspects, Sam Newman, actually jumped up and started to shout out while the verdict was being read he wanted to be taken out of the courtroom the court was then uh, resumed to order as they continued to read the verdict certainly we're waiting on family and attorneys to come out of the courtroom we'll bring you details as we get them but for now we're on your side at criminal court i'm dina swanson back to you Lot will be found guilty of conspiracy to possess tools during and in relation to other related crimes pushing that work assault with a weapon and deleting three of his ops it will be the testimony of passion that will seal Lot's fate for allegedly participating in the smashing of Vinnie Smith on April 22, 2012, the crushing of Deshaun Hoffer on June 3, 2012, and for being an aider and a better in the deletion of Travis Thomas that occurred in May of 2013. Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Lot, will be one of 11 men originally charged in August of 2014 in a superseding indictment involving weapons and pumping that work. Five members of YMM will plead guilty to the conspiracy charges and will be sentenced. Jacoby Cole Boyd was sentenced to 480 months of incarceration. Alfred L. Cobbins was sentenced to 252 months of incarceration. Sean Gunner Grayson was sentenced to 207 months of incarceration. Ruben Rue Geiger was sentenced to 220 months of incarceration. Darius D. Man Williams was sentenced to 156 months of incarceration. And DeAndre Soldier Hills was sentenced to 96 months of incarceration.
In August of 2015, federal RICO charges for crushing the ops will be added against the remaining alleged members of YMM. Any second superseding indictment, Wilson will plead guilty and was sentenced to 180 months of incarceration. Keelan will be sentenced to life plus 10 years after being convicted of multiple counts of deleting his ops. Titty will be sentenced to life in prison for his participation in the RICO. Delwood will be sentenced to 16 years of incarceration for his participation in the same conspiracy. Brian Scott will receive 20 years in prison for his role in the conspiracy. On Wednesday, December the 13th, Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Locke, will become the last of his group of five YMM members to be sentenced following being convicted. In June, Locke's co-defendants, Titty, Roy, Pooh Stupid, and Brian Scott had been sentenced earlier. That fall, Locke was convicted of 21 of the 24 counts against him. He would receive the harshest punishment of the five men. Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Locke's convictions were racketeering, three counts of crushing his ops, in the aid of racketeering, the victim would be Deshaun Hartford, Benny Smith, and Travis Thomas. Six counts of assault with a weapon in the aid of racketeering, eight counts of discharging a weapon in relation to a crime, moving that work, and a conspiracy to possess the Blickies. Smith and Harford, who had been deleted in April and June of 2012, as well as Thomas, who had been crushed in May of 2013, would all be on Lot's charges. Lot would also be accused of spitting the bin 12 different times between October 2011 and May 2013. Acting U.S. Attorney Dwayne E. Evans would announce that Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Lot, would be sentenced after having previously been found guilty of violating the Racketeer Influence Corrupt Organizations Act a.k.a. RICO. U.S. District Judge Kurt D. Engelhardt was sentenced lot to serve life in prison plus 420 months, which is 35 years, to run consecutive. Claimed by the French in 1682, New Orleans wouldn't be founded until 1718 by Jean-Baptiste Bienville. In 1803, Napoleon would orchestrate the Louisiana Purchase. The state of Louisiana would no longer be a French colony. By 1840, with a population of over 100,000, 53% white, 27% black, and 19% being people of all other origins, New Orleans would be the third largest city in the nation. Since its inception, the city of New Orleans has always been occupied by pirates, rogues, and gangsters. The Bird Gang will be described by the NOPD as one of the most notorious and deadly gangs that they have ever encountered. In August of 2021, federal prosecutors would bring charges on three members of the Bird Gang. Teron Williams, Tyron Bovia, and Javante Dolman will be charged with murder in aid of racketeering and causing death through the use of a firearm in August of 2021. In November of 2019, Four alleged members of the Burr Gang will be indicted for violation of the Louisiana Racketeering Act and other crimes related to their operation of a violent narcotics trafficking operation. In March of 2018, Randy Calvin, Chan Skipper, and James Alexander were indicted on suspicion of heroin distribution charges dating back October 2015 to May 2016. Randy Calvin, Chan Skipper, and James Alexander accused of distributing heroin from October 2015 to May 2016. Investigators say Skipper was spotted on the porch of a home in the 2400 block of South Robertson Street Thursday. They seized two Glock handguns, an assault rifle, and over 100 grams of marijuana. These individuals are, we believe, are members of the Bird Gang, and they are actively involved in violent gun violence. The cops got here, they just bomb rush. They bomb rushing the home. Um, they just bomb rushing in the house. People sitting on the porch, eating crawfish. Michelle Skipper says Chance is her son and James is her nephew. My son a good person, he ain't no bad person. Anybody, anybody could tell you that. Why would police have a, a warrant out for him, him though? 
I don't know. Authorities believe members of the Bird Gang have been engaged for months in a violent feud over narcotics with members of another gang based around the city. He had got caught with a gun before. That was his own gun. Mm -hmm. And his little weed, he was smoking. And that was it. But despite NOPD being adamant that your son's in a gang, why do you feel so strongly that he's not? He not. I don't know why. I don't know why the people is messing. I don't know why they messing with him. Law enforcement says their investigation is ongoing and gang activity in New Orleans will not be tolerated. We know who they are. We've identified them. And if they continue to remain, um, commit violent acts, we, we're going to come after them and lock them in jail. We like the famous in New Orleans, out of town, like everywhere, the whole world, like they know about us. These faces that you're seeing right now on this camera, they know what it's in. real. We don't talk too much because we know them folks listening. But understand, I feel like fuck them too. I want you to do my friend. Yeah, turn, turn that way. Turn that way. That's the fuck right there. See them folks? They got me watching them. Go watch TV. Go watch Don't TV. Don't watch me watch TV. Right, sure. This OG, rest in peace, Tay, mom. OT. For real. Cisco for sure. You already know how we rolling right here. You heard me? Time for life. OT. Very gang. Not to be confused with the Bird Gang from NY, a spinoff of the rap group Dipset. This Bird Gang was a group of young hitters out the CJP Magnolia Projects. Gerard Gray, aka Roy the Prince, will be wrongfully convicted at the age of 25 and sentenced to 100 years. Gerard will be locked up for two years awaiting trial. On June 17, 2016, he would be sentenced. From a disturbing high school dropout rate to gangs to crime, there are many challenges facing the city of New Orleans. In Central City, many people living here are well aware that gangs have been a problem for years. One day after the WDSUI team broke the story about another sweeping gang indictment, in just over a month, the district attorney and the NOPD are speaking out. Tonight, the top man at the NOPD admits his force is facing a gang problem. As we approach the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, police and prosecutors in the city of New Orleans announced the indictment and convictions of two different gangs in the city of New Orleans. But we begin with what law enforcement officials are calling a major bust. Investigators say they've taken a dangerous gang off the streets of New Orleans. The story goes like this. On July 8, 2014, John Terry Bernard, a.k.a. Pootie, fired two dozen bullets striking Mark Mitchell and Chris Chambers. During witness testimony, Pootie would claim that Jamal Jarrell, a.k.a. Melly, who was crushed in July of 2015 in the 2300 block of 4th, gave him orders to delete the two men. The group of men will get into an altercation over the basketball court at A.L. Davis, a.k.a. Shakespeare Park. It was alleged that Melly, in the words of Pootie, was told, man, you better handle that there or we gonna handle you. Pootie would claim that Melly slid him the nine millimeter Ruger with a dick on it. Gerard Gray, a.k.a. Roy the Prince, was at the park that day, but per Pootie, Gerard would not be involved in this conversation. John Terry Bernard, a.k.a. Pootie, would allege that Gerard would walk past him whispering, you heard what he said, huh? The problem with this testimony was that Pootie had given three different accounts. First, stating that he wasn't the trigger man, and second, stating that Gerard wasn't present at the park at all. Pootie would bust over 20 shots at the two men, injuring them both. Appearing in court, the victims testified that they did get into an altercation with Gerard before the shooting, but as far as Gerard giving orders or gestures to shoot, they did not see that happen. In 2010, Roy, the prince, will be acquitted in a different shooting that took place on St. Charles Avenue during the parade route in 2009. Prosecutors were adamant about getting him on something.
Gerard Gray, a.k.a. Roy the Prince, would be convicted and sentenced to 100 years. And right now we are following breaking news as New Orleans police investigate a deadly shooting in Mid-City. WDSC reporter Adam Siddiqui is live from the scene. So, Adam, what can you tell us from the scene so far? Not very much information right now. All we know is sometime after 1.30, police were called to a double shooting in Mid-City. There's actually two locations that's unfolded over a couple blocks. Here where we are at the corner of South Hennessy and Uloa, it does appear that NOPD is working a murder here. Just a couple blocks away, there was another person shot. Police do believe that these are related incidents, but certainly will bring you more details on WDSU News. But that's the very latest for now. From Mid-City, I'm Gina Swanson. In 2014, four members of the Mid-City Killers, a gang based out of the Mid-City neighborhood of New Orleans, were arrested according to a report given by the NOPD in a meeting at police headquarters. Demonte Hunter, a suspected member of the gang, the Mid-City Killers, was one of the men arrested according to records from the Sheriff's Office. The alleged gang members were arrested after police would investigate suspicious activity on the 500 block of South Cortez Street. Tamonte Hunter, 19, was arrested for possession of that heart and a probation violation. Quincy, aka Q, was arrested for possession of that dog food and a probation violation. Jesse Carter was arrested for a parole violation. Anthony Como was arrested for two warrants out of Gretna and failing to show up for a mandatory court appearance. A search of the Orleans Parish Sheriff's Office inmate database would reveal that only Jesse and DeMonte were still being held in jail. In past and current times, MCK had been associated with acts of violence, retaliation, and other crimes that have taken place in Mid-City for the past couple of years, including several instances of second-degree murder. This is the story of MCK, the Mid-City Killers. The crime stats in New Orleans are looking grim. Even though there have been fewer shootings by this point last year, more people have died in the shootings we have seen. Eleanor Tabone talked with a local crime expert who says social media could be leading to crime. According to the Metropolitan Crime Commission, there have been eight shootings across the city so far this year. 13 people killed in those incidents. They include incidents with three or more shooting victims. The carnage is something that is escalating. Late 2014, federal agents with the FBI, ATF, DEA, and members of the New Orleans Police Department multi-agency gang unit started investigating several acts of violence that had taken place in the city of New Orleans by members of a street gang called the Mid-City Killers. During the course of this investigation, agents reviewed numerous police reports, 911 calls, recorded telephone calls, and speak to numerous cooperating witnesses. Based on this investigation, agents determined that Joe Miller, aka Logger Black, not to be confused with Logger out the I got 32 on my side, you understand, and I got 17 in my back pocket, so take it how you want. Erie and Dorsey were members and or associates of the criminal street gang called the Mid-City 
Killers, a.k.a. MCK, from approximately 2010 to the time of the indictment. The members of MCK ran with Gregory Denson, a.k.a. Pep, Corey Denson, Clarence Singleton, a.k.a. Smurf, Bam, Duda, an individual known as Jazz, as well as several other known and unknown individuals. All of the men were allegedly engaged in, among other things, home invasions, robbery, conspiracy to distribute controlled substances, murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and attempted murder in the city of New Orleans. Allegedly led by Gregory Denson, some of these individuals worked together for the common purpose of conducting home invasions of known dealers, distributing illegal substances, killing and or intimidating witnesses, using and carrying numerous firearms, all in an effort to make money and retaliate against other dealers the purpose of maintaining their position within the MCK criminal street gang. Gregory Pep Denson, 54, who federal prosecutors would say led a criminal gang involved in violent home invasions, robberies, and deals in New Orleans and Jefferson Parish, would admit to killing a federal witness. According to U.S. Attorney Dwayne Evans, investigators would state that Pep killed one of his associates at a reward. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At first, I would like to, uh, to express my thoughts and and prayers to all victims of crime. However, our community continues to suffer from brazen acts of violence throughout the Eastern District of Louisiana, and specifically New Orleans, and especially in other parts of the country and the state of Louisiana. We are assembled this afternoon for a press conference to reassure the public that we are a team and that we're working together. As a group, we recognize that occasionally, it may seem that we're not working together, but like every family, we find a way to work out our differences. We stand before you today united with a common goal to work as hard as possible to protect the public because the public deserves no less. I mentioned earlier in the speech last year that in order to reduce violent crime, it will take a collaboration between federal, state, and local law enforcement. The involvement of community leaders, business leaders, teachers, and most importantly, parents. To prevent him from telling police about the string of robbery and other crimes, Ellery's body was found in the industrial canal in May of 2014, only days after he had been released from jail. Three weeks earlier, Ellery had agreed to cooperate with authorities who were looking into the botched robbery of a Gretna dealer. The guilty plea from Pep was one of nine federal prosecutors who were obtained from an indictment against members of the Mid-City Killers. The defendants were accused of invading the homes of killers and robbing them of cash, jewels, and weapons, according to a statement from the U.S. Attorney. Prosecutors would say the end goal of the game was to establish their dominance in the local trade by taking out their competitors. Authorities would also say that Pep recruited his nephew, Corey Denson, Ellery Boyd, Clarence Singleton, Quincy Giles, and Joe Miller to take part in violent home invasion spawned from 2013 to 2014. Three women in the group, Annette S. Robinson, Esquilita Camouche, and Bridget M. Miles would allegedly scout the homes and help the crew determine which one should be hit. The crew would sometimes use Anthony Jackson's whip for robberies and home invasions. During an April 11th of 2014 home invasion, one person was pistol whipped and another victim's SUV was stolen. Five days later, MCK would make off with 90 racks, buku work, and other valuables from a lick they had hit in the city. In April of 2014, Ellery was arrested while trying to flee an aborted home invasion. An EWDSU news reporter would play on that boy, indicating that he was cooperating with the police on a live news broadcast. It was this that would trigger Pep to tell the crew Ellery was a rat and needed to be crushed. Pep would then go with his move, bonding Ellery out of jail, getting Ellery's girl and another person to sign the documents. They would both sign their names, not knowing Pep was trying to keep his name off any and all.
paperwork. Running Junkie G, Pep would chop it up with Ellery about pulling off under the lake, later taking Ellery to a crib in the 7700 block of Cola Pisa Street. It was there that Pep would hit him up, shooting him in the chest and back multiple times. Pep would later take Anthony to the murder scene, asking him if he wanted to see the dead rat. While bragging about smashing Ellery, Pep would show the murder weapon to Anthony as Anthony drove Pep through the spent shell casing out the window of the truck. Two nights later, Pep started spooking about surveillance camera being near the crib where he had smashed dude. Spooking on them dicks, Pep would get his homies to help dispose of the body. Using Anthony's truck, Pep, his nephew, Joe, and Quincy would wrap Ellery's body in plastic, fasten it to concrete, afterwards dumping the body in the industrial canal. The following month, things would go wrong for the game while they were on under the lick. The tenant would return home while they were there. The men would rope him up and jack him of a thousand dollars cash, a few bundles of dog food and jewelry. Struggling to break free, he would confront the gang in another apartment where Joe would hit him up several times. In May of 2012, Joe and Quincy would be accused of smashing Oscar Johnson. Per Bullet.com, the NOPD was investigating the shooting death of a 33-year-old man at the intersection of Fillmore Avenue and Vermilion Boulevard on Tuesday, May 8th of 2012. Oscar Johnson collapsed in the middle of Fillmore Avenue at Vermilion Boulevard, a block from Elite Fields Avenue, after someone in a sport utility vehicle opened fire at about 12.30 p.m. A white Ford Escape with dark tinted windows would speed away. Officers chased the whip for miles before losing it uptown. One man who lives around the corner from the scene of the shooting stated that he heard about 17 shots while he was watching the 12 o'clock news. Crime scene technicians would eventually place more than two dozen evidence cones often used to mark bullet casings on the street and neutral ground near where Oscar had been hit up. Agents would also review numerous 911 calls, police reports, and recorded telephone calls. There would also be numerous cooperating witnesses involved in the prosecution. Walking down the block with a friend of mine, you know, guy just come up to him, you know, thank the Lord, he didn't want to do me nothing. He took and just popped the guy in the face, pow, blood went all over me. I freaked out. I just stood there, I couldn't move. Then I heard the sirens and I walked on off. Pep was facing a maximum sentence of life in prison and a $250,000 fine if convicted. A verdict would be reached. U.S. District Court Judge Carl J. Warrior sentenced Pep to a term of 30 years in prison with five years of supervised release following his term of imprisonment. Four members of the Mid-City Killers Gang, a group of prosecutors would say was responsible for five homicides throughout the city of New Orleans, would be sentenced to prison after they previously pleaded guilty in connection with the five shootings. Three gang members, Dwayne Wayne Miller, Glenn G. Greystone Emerson, Richard Trey Ward, pled guilty to charges related to shootings and gang activity. A fourth gang member, Tyron Watson, would also plead guilty. Wayne, 25, and Glenn, 23, each pled in connection with the fatal shootings of Lawrence Bird and Vivian Snyder in 2012, as well as Isaac Big Ike Stern, Joseph Massenberg, and Ricky Johnson in 2013. Criminal District Judge Karen Herman sentenced both men to serve a total of 40 years at prison at hard labor. They were sentenced as part of a plea deal to serve time on five omitted counts of manslaughter, five counts of attempted second degree, and one count of conspiracy to commit second degree as part of a pattern of criminal gang activity. Herman would impose 40-year sentences for each of the manslaughter and attempted second degree charges and a 30-year sentence on the conspiracy charge. The sentences to be served concurrently. Gray pleaded guilty to three amended counts of manslaughter for his role in the deaths of Stern, Massenberg, and Johnson and also to one count of attempted murder and conspiring to commit murder in furtherance of gang activity. 
activity, he was sentenced to serve 20 years in prison on each of the charges. Those sentences will be served concurrently. Watson pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit second degree and accessory. After the fact to second degree, he was sentenced that same day. Watson was originally facing charges on second degree. Prosecutors will reduce it to an accessory charge. He was sentenced to serve five years in prison on each count to be served concurrently. This with the story of the Mid-City Killers. In the early 1990s, at the peak of the NOPD's brutality and corruption, things would come to a head. The ongoing issues would draw national attention. The New York Times Magazine would publish an article, March of 1996, describing the NOPD as the thinnest blue line. The article would note New Orleans was the nation's homicide capital in 1992 and in 1994, pointing out that the NOPD had only solved 37% of the murders in the city, which would be roughly half the national average. Federal officials would estimate that 15-20% to 20 of the force was corrupt. The NOPD has long been a troubled agency. Basic elements of effective policing, clear policies, training, accountability, and confidence of the citizens had been absent for many years. Far too often, officers show a lack of respect for the civil rights and dignity of the people of New Orleans. Many officers of every rank were claimed not to understand or choose to ignore the boundaries of constitutional policing. As the systematic violations of civil rights would erode public confidence, policing became more difficult, less safe, and less effective as crime would in Crease. Melvin Williams, age 50, known on the streets of the N.O. as Flat Top, was known among the residents of New Orleans as being one of the dirtiest cops on the force who had a history of using grimy tactics to garner a record of high output of arrest in the city's high crime areas. When Flat Top was a part of the task force, he would be notoriously known for planting evidence on suspects, particularly those in projects and in the hood. Dean Moore, age 38, was a rookie just 77 days out of the academy when he would be placed under Flat Top's tutelage. Dean was a hawking former semi-professional hockey player with the New Orleans Brass, eager to rise through the police ranks in his adopted city and eventually become a federal drug enforcement agent. On the morning of July 30th of 2005, the two were traveling through Treme, working an overtime shift, when they would spot Raymond Robert preparing to repair the vent on a neighbor's roof. For reasons that are still unclear, the officer would converge on Raymond in the 1500 block of Dumain Street. Witnesses would state that Flat Top administered a fatal kick amid a flurry of baton strikes. Within minutes, the officers would dump Raymond at Charity Hospital, telling staffers they found him on the ground under a bridge and believed that he had overdosed on that hard. Raymond would soon succumb to the beating that was afflicted upon him. Pathologists would find his ribs fractured and his spleen lacerated. Both officers would testify that they never slammed, struck, kicked, or punched Raymond, going on to say that Raymond ran from them and fell hard to the street. Though some aspects of their narrative contained in early police reports, statements and testimony at trial were clashed, including their story about the possession of an illegal substance. Flat Top, who faced a maximum sentence of life in prison, stood first before Judge Fallon. His attorney, Frank DeSalvo, argued that the sentencing range of 21 to 27 years, as recommended by prosecutors, was ex. Excessive. Judge Fallon would dismiss the argument sentencing Flat Top to 262 months, more than 21 years in prison, ordering him to pay more than $11,000 in restitution to Raymond's family. After a five minute recess, Dean Moore would stand before the judge. Dean faced up to 25 years in prison, though prosecutors would recommend a sentence of 9 to 11 years. Judge Fallon, before handing down Dean's sentence, noted that Dean was on the scene at the time of the beating. The judge would then add that Dean Moore was also at the hospital and witnessed the lies. Judge Fallon would announce a 70-month prison term for Dean Moore for his participation in the 
crimes. As was convicted on three counts of capital murder along with ex NOPD officer Antoinette Frank. The duo both sentenced to die for killing Frank's fellow police officer Ronald Williams and two members of the family that owned the restaurant they were robbing. As Antoinette Frank stood in the cramped kitchen of the Kim An restaurant, a nine millimeter will be clutched in her hand, kneeling on the dirty floor. At Antoinette's feet were 17 year old Kwang Vu and his 24 year old sister Ha. Kwang was an altar boy at St. Bridget Catholic Church. He played high school football and wanted to be a priest. Ha was considering becoming a nun. Both worked long hours at their parents' restaurant. Antoinette would allegedly fire nine times, striking them both. Ha Vu would die instantly. When detectives found her, she was still on her knees, her forehead resting on the floor. Kwang took longer to die. Antoinette would allegedly shoot him repeatedly in the chest and back, but his young athletic heart would continue to beat. After hearing him trying to talk, Antoinette would allegedly shoot him again, this time firing two bullets in his head. Antoinette and her alleged partner in crime, an 18-year-old named Rogers Lacaz, would ransack the Bullard Avenue restaurant until they found what they were looking for, the money. Born in Appaloosa, Frank was a member of the Appaloosa Junior Police and the New Orleans Police Explorers. When she turned 20, Antoinette would apply to the New Orleans Police Department. Almost immediately, Antoinette's application would run into problems. The application investigation unit discovered Antoinette had been fired from Walmart and had lied about it in her application. She was borderline anyway. Mm. She lied about her termination from her last job and didn't mention on her application that she has a brother who was a longtime fugitive. Too bad. We need black women particularly. Antoinette also scored poorly on two standardized psychological evaluations. The psychologist who reviewed Antoinette's test would recommend a psychiatric interview. Dr. Phillip, a board certified psychiatrist, would evaluate Antoinette on 14 characteristics relevant to the job of a police officer. He would rate Antoinette as unacceptable or below average in most categories. This would trigger Antoinette to write a note. In it, she would contemplate taking her own life. In a shocking turn of events, Antoinette would be finally accepted onto the police force. Officer Antoinette Frank, the woman who will become the poster child for police misconduct and the living symbol of a department gone bad, would meet Rogers Lacaz just past his 18th birthday. Rogers, who already had a history of violence and drug peddling, would be shot shortly after meeting Antoinette. Upon his recovery and release from the hospital, the two will become like Batman and Robin, going with the move on hustlers throughout the city. It was alleged that the two would hit a lick that would leave members of the Vu family owners of the Kim Ahn's restaurant dead, and NOPD officer Ronnie Williams deceased face down behind the bar of the restaurant in a pool of blood. Rogers Lacaz will go to trial in July of 1995, deciding to take the stand in his own defense. It was a bad move against his attorney's advice. The jury will convict Rogers Lacaz of murder and recommend he be put to death. Antoinette Frank will go on trial two months later. After prosecutors Glenn Woods and Elizabeth Till rested the state's case against Antoinette, a lawyers would essentially give up. Although they subpoenaed nearly 40 witnesses, they wouldn't call a single one to the stand. It would take the jury 40 minutes to convict Antoinette Frank on three counts of first degree murder. Well, this all happened just within the last two hours today. An Orleans criminal district judge has resentenced Roger Lacaz to life in prison without parole. This is the latest in that stunning triple murder case that has gripped the New Orleans Police Department and this community for the last 24 years. Lacaz was convicted on three counts of capital murder along with ex NOPD officer Antoinette Frank. The duo both sent sentenced to die for killing Frank's fellow police officer Ronald Williams and two members of the family that owned the restaurant they were robbing. 
Lacaz was set to die by lethal injection on March 15, 1996, but that never happened. And after repeat appeals, he was back in court today. At today's resentencing, the judge noted that the death sentence is now off the table. He sentenced Lacaz to life without parole instead. His mother, who was inside that courtroom today, said she will not stop fighting for his freedom. The clothes he had on, the white tennis are still white today. The long sleeve shirt was no powder burn ever found on his hands, no evidence, no blood, no nothing. And they want to give him a life sentence without parole. It's like a puzzle. You can have a puzzle with 90 pieces. If one missing, something's wrong with that puzzle, right? The judge did not consider any of that evidence that the mom just talked about here in court today. However, he did consider the defense's argument that Lacaze was too young and impressionable to receive a life sentence for a crime he committed when he was 18 years old. The judge dismissing that motion, and he also denied the de defense's suggestion for a resentence. He did allow Lacaze's family to sit with him in the courtroom today for a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with his family. I should also also note that Antoinette Frank has not been executed in this case either. She remains in prison. Damn, Eric. The fuck we gonna do now? Almost three decades ago, corruption would ripple through the New Orleans Police Department. Hidden inside the force were badge-bearing criminals who accepted bribes, sold dope, robbed dealers, and committed homicides. Few were as notorious as Lynn Davis and an OPD officer known as the Desire Terrorist, who led a small crew of enforcers pushing Yale throughout the streets of the N.O. all while providing cover to dealers using violence, intimidation, and falsified evidence. This is the story of Lynn Davis, a.k.a. Robocop. In what will be called the largest case of police corruption in the city's history, nine New Orleans police officers were charged in federal court with accepting nearly $100,000 in bribes to protect a large-scale Yayo operation run by undercover FBI agents. The investigation was launched in December of 1993 when 5th District Officers Lynn Davis and Sammy Williams began extorting bribes and offering protection to a known dealer. That known dealer would turn out to be a federal informant. Even in a city as widely accustomed to crooked cops as New Orleans, Lynn Davis stood out. In his six years on the police force, he had become known in the projects as Robocop on account of his highly individualistic style of law enforcement, aka hacking up everybody on the set. The subject of more than 20 complaints, mostly for brutality and intimidation, Lynn had once been suspended for hitting a woman in the head with his flashlight. Don't get it twisted. It wasn't that Lynn worried about complaints at all. Most of the complaints against Lynn would have a weird way of just fizzling out as terrified witnesses would suddenly develop amnesia or become tongue-tied. Lynn Davis had worked for the 5th District with Officer Sammy Williams for years. Lynn would be unhappy with his salary. Her salary at the time was $18,000 a year. Despite earning only eighteen dollars a year, Lynn was living the life of Raleigh. One may ask how could Lynn afford lavish trips, impulse spending on clothes and jewelry, along with a laundry list of other over-the-top expenses. The answer will be quietly hidden behind one word, corruption. In December of 1993, 5th District Officers Lynn Davis and Sammy Williams will begin extorting bribes and offering protection. In the following months, the FBI would orchestrate an elaborate sting, watching in amazement as Lynn and Sammy recruited seven other cops to protect shipments and guard what they believed to be a warehouse filled with work on Franklin Avenue, sometimes even being bold enough to guard the area in uniform. However, the trafficking probe would be abruptly halted after Lynn would order the execution of Kim Groves. The feds were targeting as many as 20 NOPD officers when the undercover investigation ended, allegedly due to Lynn's execution plot. There were a number of other police officers who were ready and prepared to go forward with playing a role in protecting what they believed to be Yayo in this undercover operation. The officers indicted in the case were Lynn Davis, 
Sammy Williams, Sergeant Carlos Rodriguez, Adam Dees, Christopher Evans of the 5th District, Keith Johnson, and Sheldon Pope of the 2nd District, Brian Brown assigned to public housing, and Larry Smith assigned to the juvenile division. All would face charges of conspiracy to distribute Yale in the use of firearms while trafficking. Upon being appointed in October, Richard Pennington would immediately suspend the nine officers vowing to weed out corrupt cops through aggressive internal investigations. The feds would use real Yayo throughout the investigation. More than 130 birds were used throughout the sting, as well as real money. 97,000 of which were distributed to officers in payments as large as six racks. In September, a disturbing development would take place. The feds were able to intercept conversations among officers who were on the protection detail. Those officers were plotting to go with the move on the fake connect. Led by Lynn, the crooked cops would proceed with caution at first, suspecting a possible setup by the feds. At various times, the police officers would conduct their own counter surveillance of the undercover agents posing as dealers. As faith would have it, one early meeting would almost lead to a showdown. Worried that the corrupt cops were onto him, the undercover agent would be very clever, stripping down to his underwear in front of the officers to show that he was not wearing a wire at the time. The police officers who had also become worried would do the same. This interaction would all be captured on video. In April, the officers would agree to protect a new incoming shipment. To the agent's amazement, the cops would show up in uniform. What was surprised the feds the most was the ease at which new officers were brought in to the stain. That same month, agents would set up a warehouse at 420 Franklin Avenue and ask for around-the-clock police guards. Feeling like he needed more manpower, Lynn would state that he needed to bring in more officers to help. The warehouse protection would be ran almost like a paid detail, the same as a move lot job many of the officers already held. The feds would make the deal lucrative, making a pay scale much higher than the usual $15 an hour that the officers were earning. The unsupervised, unregulated system would practically encourage officers to break the law. A big break in the case would come when Lynn, who was described as the ringleader of the nine cops, would ask for a cell phone to conduct business. It would be that cell phone that was used to monitor the details associated with the protection of the warehouse. The cell phone was also used to monitor the calls in which Lynn would allegedly order the Groves hit. Minutes before the slaying, Lynn could be heard giving Cool Hardy a description of Kim Groves' clothing. After the slain was officially logged as a homicide by police, Lynn and Sammy would be overheard celebrating the deletion with Hardy. Federal agents who were monitoring the phone lines, the crushings were discussed, but later claimed they were powerless to prevent the crushings from happening. This would send outrage throughout the streets of the N.O. Locals would say that the feds were more concerned with making a bust than saving the life of Kim Groves. Within days after the slinging, the FBI would allegedly overhear Lynn and his partners planning more violent acts. It was those conversations that would lead to a decision to shut down the operation. The shutdown would be ordered even as agents were gathering evidence on additional officers. Lynn's reign had ended with a single shot fired that evening in 1994. Kim Groves, the mother of three that witnessed Lynn and Sammy pistol whip a dude, had been executed. Lynn was convicted of conspiracy in 1996. A federal jury was sentenced Lynn to death after a trial that would reveal the inner workings of his crime reign. This was the story of Lynn Davis, AKA Robocop. First at five and new at five, it made national headlines when a New Orleans cop ordered the murder of a mother of three for coming forward to report police misconduct. To mark the 20 year anniversary of Kim Groves' death, the Office of the Independent Police Monitor is now calling on the NOPD to review its current retaliation policy and procedures in a new report. Reporter Andy Cunningham is live with us right now with more on what's in the report that was released this afternoon. Andy. The report is 25 pages long, Camille, and lays out some changes the police monitor's office believes should be made to the department's retaliation policy. They claim in this report still needs some work. Many people still remember the shocking murder for hire that led to the shooting death of Kim Groves, a ninth ward mother of three, who a day before she was executed by a hitman ordered by New Orleans police officer Len Davis, reported Davis and his partner for police brutality. In this report, released Friday, 20 years to the month 
following the 32-year-old's death, the independent police monitor is requesting the NOPD take a good hard look at its current retaliation policy and procedures. The way to stop retaliation is to not be afraid of it and to speak out. Once you speak out, I can do something about it. If I don't hear about it, there's not too much I can do. Independent police monitor Susan Hudson said the perception that employees and civilians do not report misconduct out of fear or retaliation creates public distrust of the department. In her office's report, they break down the allegations into two categories, retaliation against NOPD employees and retaliation against members of the community. From 2011 to 2013, they received 26 reports of retaliation inside the NOPD and 63 reports of retaliation or fear of retaliation from the public. And now, while the NOPD is revising all of its policies and procedures, now's the time to get on this retaliation policy and make changes. And this isn't something the NOPD is shying away from. The monitor's office acknowledged today they are working closely with the department and its new chief, Michael Harrison, in an effort to come up with better ways to address and prevent retaliation. Scott? Andy, thanks. And this coming Monday, the NOPD is expected to join the police monitor's office at a public forum inside city council chambers to discuss the policy. And a police spokesperson says they'll use the feedback from the community when putting together the new policy. Firing. Bullets came through here and went through my, my wall. There's a hole there, a hole here, holes behind the sofa. It sounded like a war zone. A war zone, high powered machine guns in this city. The Garden District is a neighborhood of New Orleans, Louisiana, a sub-district of Central City. Its boundaries, as defined by the New Orleans City Planning Commission, are St. Charles Avenue to the north, First Street to the east, Magazine Street to the south, and Taladonna Street to the west. The area was originally developed between 1832 and 1900 and is considered one of the best preserved collections of historic mansions in the southern United States. The 19th century origins of the Garden District illustrate wealthy newcomers building opulent structures based upon the prosperity of New Orleans in that era. The Garden District Association defines the Garden District's boundaries as both sides of Carondelet Street, Josephine Street, both sides of Louisiana Avenue, and Magazine Street. Centrally located in New Orleans Historic Garden District with fast and easy access to I-10, the Josephine Street neighborhood offers an ideal location where residents can indulge in the renowned shopping and dining of the New Orleans Warehouse District, CBD, and the historic French Quarter. Josephine is within walking distance of the St. Charles Streetcar Line as well as Magazine Street, which is home to a variety of shops, restaurants, and nightlife. Sound like somebody move here. Da, 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 da. Damn, hey. The fuck we gonna do now? Michael Mike Mike Anderson didn't stand trial for the 2006 quintuple murder known as the Central City Massacre. Instead, he will plead guilty in federal court to helping plan an unrelated murder, a charge that calls for a life sentence. As part of the plea deal, Mike Mike admitted in U.S. District Court that he helped run a drug operation, threatened witnesses, shot at a police officer, and committed robberies. Without a doubt, the activities of the gang known as the Josephine Dog Pound created what prosecutors have described as a climate of fear in the area bounded by Josephine and Denell Streets. This is the story of the Josephine Dog Pound Gangsters. Michael Anderson, a.k.a. Mike Mike, would acknowledge arranging the killing of Ronnie Mead, a father of nine who was hit up for going to them dicks when Mike Mike went with the move on him. All eight of the dog-bound gangsters charged in the sprawling racketeering case will plead guilty in federal court. Several will be sentenced to prison stints ranging from 15 years to life. The dog pound controlled the neighborhood drug trade dating back at least seven years and centering their operations on and around the Josephine Street neighborhood. The group will be held accountable for allegedly being behind four murders, as well as several other attempted murders and shootings. In 2009, Mike Mike will become the first person to receive a state death sentence in New Orleans since 
1997 after a jury convicted him of first degree murder in the 2006 fatal shootings of the five teams, aka the Central City Massacre. A state judge will later set aside the verdict and death sentence, ruling Mike Mike deserved a new trial in part because of a videotaped interview of a key witness that wasn't turned over to the defense. A retrial would never happen as Mike Mike would reach a plea deal that resolved separate state and federal charges against him. In less than 12 hours, criminal court judge Linda Van Davis will decide if convicted murderer Michael Anderson gets a new trial. Let's go live to Mid-City where WDSUI team reporter Travers Mackle is standing by with tonight's big local story. Good evening, Travers. Good evening, Rachel. These killings shock the community. Five teens gunned down in Central City back in 2006. Now, Michael Anderson may get a new trial and a big question has to be asked. Did prosecutors make a mistake? In order to get a new trial, there really has to be a, a almost a perfect alignment of the planets in the sense that you have to have some mistake or misconduct and prejudice, which means that mistake or misconduct actually affected the result. Uh, and in this case, I think it's likely that the judge will probably find both. Anderson's defense lawyers say prosecutors withheld videotape evidence during the trial, a tape where the eyewitness in the case says Anderson may not have been the trigger man. And defense lawyers also say Prosecutors gave a jailhouse snitch who testified against Anderson a sweetheart deal. In a letter we first showed you last week, District Attorney Leon Canazaro called the informant a hero. This case was uh, essentially a two-witness case, an eyewitness and a jailhouse informant. And there was critical evidence that was not turned over to the defense that could have been used to cross-examine both of those witnesses. A spokesperson for the DA's office says everything was handled above board and the conviction is solid. The 2006 killings prompted then-Governor Kathleen Blanco to call the National Guard back to the city to patrol. With the police department under several federal investigations for post-Katrina shootings, Legal analysts say overturning a high-profile conviction is the last thing the DA needs. This, this conviction is vacated tomorrow. It's going to be a result of uh, essentially prosecutorial misconduct. In March of 2011, Mike Mike pleaded guilty to federal drugs, murder, and racketeering conspiracy charges stemming from a federal probe of the Josephine Dog Pound Gang. Mike Mike was one of the eight gang members charged in the case and was the last to be sentenced. Special Agent Mike Eberhardt of the ATF, who led the federal probe of the Josephine Dog Pound Gang, stated investigators posted violent crimes on a map of the city and noticed the high rate of violent crimes happening in the Josephine neighborhood. Went on to say that the Josephine Dog Pound was among the most violent gangs in the city, terrorizing the neighborhoods around them. The ATF would build their case by immersing themselves in the neighborhood, knocking on residents' doors and making it obvious that they were watching the off Josephine. On July 12, 2005, Mike Mike Jack Ronnie at gunpoint and was arrested a day later after Ronnie went to them dicks. While Mike Mike was locked up, he spoke to Ronnie over the phone, threatening him to recant his story and drop the charges. A different dude off the Joes would be accused of fatally shooting Ronnie outside of his home on July 14th of 2005. Michael Anderson, aka Mike Mike, Harold Jones, aka Duty, Theron Jones, aka TJ, Jeremiah Milro, aka Jerry, Corey Oliver, Daryl Shields, aka Snook, Jerome Simmons, aka Buddy, and Tony Simmons, aka Yayo, would all be indicted for their involvement in a racketeering enterprise. The indictment will read that all were members of the organization known as the Dog Pound Gangsters and engaged in, among other things, conspiracy to distribute controlled substances, distribution of controlled substances, murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and attempted murder. Shortly before 3.40 p.m. on September 4th of 2006, Corey, Snook, and TJ were riding together in the whip when they passed the scatter sites located at 1828 Washington Avenue. It was spot their op and other men who were affiliated with a rival clique. As they slid through, a short confrontation would take place between the ops, Corey, Snook, and TJ. All three men would go back to the hood and jump on pedal bikes, riding back to the scatter sites on Washington Avenue to confront their ops. Snook was strapped with a nine at the time. When the ops saw them approaching the scatter sites for a second time, he knew it was about to go 
down. The ops started busting at them with his 38 caliber. Snook started to hit back with the nine chasing dude, ultimately hitting him in the leg and deleting an innocent bystander. During all of the commotion, Corey would drop his cell phone on drives, which would later be recovered by the NOPD. Corey Oliver would plead guilty to participating in a RICO with conspiracy to distribute 280 grams or more of that hard 11.5 and that green and was sentenced to 20 years of imprisonment. Theron Jones, aka TJ, would plead guilty to using a firearm during a violent crime, drug and guns conspiracies, and racketeering. Carol Jones, aka Duty, would plead guilty to participating in a RICO with conspiracy to distribute 280 grams or more of that hard 11.5 and that green. Duty would also plead guilty to using and carrying a firearm and in retaliation to a crime of violence, as well as a trafficking crime that caused the death of Elwood Pleasant on March 23rd of 2004, was sentenced to 30 years of imprisonment. Tony Simmons, aka Yayo, will plead guilty to participating in the RICO with conspiracy to distribute 280 grams or more of that hard 11.5 and that green. Yayo would also plead guilty to causing death through the use of a firearm for the murder of Ronnie Mead on July 14th of 2005, as well as being a felon in possession of a firearm and was sentenced to 30 years of in imprisonment. Jerome Simmons will plead guilty to assault with a deadly weapon in aid of racketeering and was sentenced to 15 years. Aramiah Milro, aka Jerry, was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison after pleading guilty to using a firearm during a crime that caused the death of Elwood Pleasant. Daryl Shields, aka Snook, was sentenced to life imprisonment by U.S. District Court Judge Martin L. C. Feldman. Snook pled guilty to counts 1, 2, 6, and 12 of the federal superseding indictment, which called for a term of life imprisonment. Count 1 charged Snook for participating in a racketeer influenced and corrupt organization, aka RICO conspiracy. Count 2 charged Snook with conspiracy to distribute 280 grams or more of that hard 11.5 and that green. Count 6 charged Snook with murder in aid of racketeering pertaining to the death of Ronnie Meade. Count 12 charged Snook with murder in aid of racketeering pertaining to the death of Herbert Lane. Michael Anderson, aka Mike Mike, would be the last person sentenced to death by an Orleans Parish jury. However, that would not last long as he is now scheduled for release from prison thanks to a steep reduction in his sentence that a federal judge will grant him for lying on Telly Hankton, aka Wow, aka Third. Michael Mike Mike Anderson had already seen his death sentence reduced to life while in federal prison. But now, as of current times, he's due to be released in July of 2025, a recent change that the Federal Bureau of Prisons will confirm as fact, not rumor. Mike Mike will be free at the age of 38. This with the story of the Josephine Dog Pound Gangsters. Known as New Orleans red-headed stepsister, Algiers would be established in 1719, making it the second oldest neighborhood in the city. Originally owned by Bienville as part of the King's Plantation, it would stretch from Plaquemines to Donaldsonville and then to Natchez. It would be the site of the pens that held the enslaved Africans that were arrested, cleaned up, and ferried across the river to the French Quarter, where they would be sold into a lifetime of slavery, either locally or up and down the length of the river to the new French landowners. Algiers would also be the site of the city's powder magazine for which Powder Street was named and the city's slaughterhouse, which was called Slaughterhouse Point in its early history. As common belief may have it, Algiers is not just Algiers Point. Algiers stretches along 12 miles of riverfront from the Riverview neighborhood at Jefferson Parish Line to the cutoff at Plaquemines Parish Line with a depth of about 4 miles. This land would originally be Cypress Swamp with prairie lands to its rear. Algiers was developed from a community of hamlets with such names as Dovergeville, Mossyville, Oliveraville, Gosselinville, Belleville, Brooklynville, McDonoughville, Ebuffville, Hindyville, Somerville, Leesville, McLeelanville, The Cutoff, Aurora, Stanton, Silver City, and Oakdale. The land would be cleared and plantation homes built along the riverfront. The Spanish would arrive in 1769. They would sell off the lands in Algiers belonging to the Crown and aided homesteaders to establish farms and develop the West Bank. The two most famous of these early landowners would be Bartholomew Duverger. 
whose land will be divided into lots in the 1840s to form what we now know as Algiers Point and John McDonough's, whose home was on Adams Street between Newton and Homer Street. McDonough's home and several other buildings throughout the history of Algiers slipped into the river when landsliders or crevices occurred. The first settlers would be the French and later the Spanish who would till the land with the help of the slaves. Later immigrant groups were Les Americanes from the eastern seaboard after the 1803 Louisiana Purchase. Then would come the Germans, the Irish, the Italians and Sicilians and other smaller European groups of immigrants. Before 1803, Catholicism would be the only acceptable religion in Louisiana. But after that date, Algiers and the rest of Louisiana were infiltrated by Methodists, Lutherans, Episcopalians and Baptists. Algiers would be built up along the riverfront from 1819 with large shipbuilding and ship repair interests. Dry docks, sawmills, lumber yards, and an iron foundry added to the commercial corridor on the river. Most of the inhabitants in the mid 19th century would have occupants related to shipbuilding. Early commercial interests in Algiers would include lumber, wax, and sugar. The lower coast continued with a history of truck farms, citrus groves, dairies, and plantations into the early part of the 20th century. Before all of this, Algiers would have a Native American population whose encampment would be situated on what is now Opelousas Avenue. The Cajuns would come into Louisiana in 1785. They would be rested in a warehouse in Algiers where they would be supplied with seed and tools before heading upstream to their land grant that would be given to them by the Spanish. The events leading up to the investigation of D-Block will begin in the summer of 2005. The NOPD would link the crushing of two Avondale cousins to DVG. The bodies will be discovered on May 8th in Digall Manor inside the trunk of a car. Both men have been tied in the head in the head. Detectives would have enough physical evidence to charge DBG. In July, Jamal Brooks, Hiram Brooks, and Nicholas Wick will be charged with first degree for another double crushing which are taking place on June 27th. The smashing in June was that of a man and a woman. According to authorities, the two were smashed inside of their home in the 1600 block of Merrill Street after being hit up more than 20 times. The NOPD will confirm they were not the intended targets. March 2006, police would arrest Jerome Gray and Connell Williams in the Gulf Manor for allegedly busting caves in the courtyard. The cutters will be traced back to the April 26th crush in the 2300 block of Merle Street. In April of 2006, the NOPD Fort District would link Brian Thomas as the fourth suspect to the June 27th double crushing. In July of 2006, the NOPD would arrest five DBG members in the Fisher Projects. Anthony Nutt Thomas, who was suspected of the April 26th incident, would have an active warrant. Squad team would raid the complex and find the group. One of them was in possession of an SKS. All five men would be booked. Thomas, who had a pending warrant, would be booked with two counts of illegally carrying a firearm, possession of an obliterated serial number, possession of 11-5, and resisting of an officer allegedly formed in their Elders neighborhood by teenagers who lived in Degal Manor in the Fisher Projects. The name DBG will be derived from the apartments which were nicknamed D-Block. The D-Block clique will be tied to several crushing, most of which were between 2005 and 2007. The NOPD's 4th District claimed to have been tracking DBG since the mid-2000s as they pumped dog food and their girl out of abandoned units in the Degal Manor apartment. Investigators would state that D Block had access to choppers and 40s, which they used in conflicts with rivals. The NOPD would link DBG to nine deletion in Algiers, five in Jefferson Parish from 2004 to 2006. In 2011, the Federal Bureau of Investigation would list DBG as a threat. In 2017, three members will be arrested on Westport Court in a raid of possession of a blicky while in possession of that boy and that girl, possession of a stolen gat, and possession with the intent to distribute 11.5 in that perk, as well as a felon being in possession of a firearm. During the search, detectives will confiscate multiple tools, 31 bags of 11.5, and 35 bags of that perk. In 2006, the NOPD would confirm a dozen hits in Algiers would be connected to D-Block. Within the past two years, there had been a rash of hits in the 4th District, 15 of those will be linked to D-Block. DBG was rumored to mainly be composed of young adults ages ranging from 16 to 25, popping out of the Gold Manor. A 365-unit housing project 
It has since then been renamed the Woodlands Apartments, located at 3300 Santa Drive. The low-income apartments have struggled from a high crime rate since the early 90s. Residents of the apartments will state that DVG have been pumping in the manor for years. 70% of the complex will be single mothers that will complain about hearing and seeing shootouts and dudes hustling on a daily basis. Steppers and hustlers would also be active in Jackson Landing and Park Fontaine. DVG would defend their turf against outsiders. With approximately 140 of the units vacated due to Hurricane Katrina, the remaining units would be in terrible shape and in need of repairs. The boarded up apartments would serve as trap houses. DVG would play the courtyards and freeways strapped with choppers equipped with 75 round magazines. Before Katrina, the Woodlands reputation will be that of one of the most dangerous housing complex on the West Bank. The corner of Murrow will become one of the biggest sets in the city by the late 90s. In 2004, a man would narrowly escape with his life after his car windshield was hit up with an M16 in the driveway of his building. Months later, on December 10th, an OBD Fort District Captain will be injured after he stopped a suspect for truancy. The manager of the Woodlands would refuse to comment on D-Block and their alleged activity. DBG wouldn't be the only ones pumping in Algeria. The Whitney Boys, Fisher Food, and McClendonville Posse were all getting it in. D-Block would be listed as the most violent by the NOPD. Fort District would state that the turf wars would intensify after the deletion of Bernard Williams, a.k.a. Busy. Busy, 17 at the time, was loved and respected in the hood. Busy would be deleted in August of 2005 on Wall Boulevard and Merrill Street. He was hit up around 7 p.m. near Christopher Holmes. This would spark several retaliatory crushings up until Katrina. The bar formerly located at 3901 Delia Street would appear in the New Orleans Time Picayune in 1933. Its liquor license had been revoked for allowing patrons to drink on premises permitted solely for the sale of beer in unopened packages. Housed in a small building on the corner of Delia and Durgeon Ward, deep in the third ward, the bar will be renamed Rose Tavern shortly after the 1941 completion of the Calio housing development. The Rose Tavern, located across the street from the Calio Central Courtyard, will become the meeting place for the people out the yoke and a clubhouse for the Calio High Steppers. Outsiders would only know the bar as an intermittent location for crushings, stick ups, and dice game arrests that were repeatedly reported in the newspaper. Also famous for the mural of Randall Watts, aka Calio Slim. The Tav, after more than 70 years, of operation were closed due to the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. On October 31st, 1997, Terrence Benjamin, aka T-Man, and co-defendant Adam Cobbin would delete Jermaine Rodriguez. It is alleged that Jermaine was running with T-Man's ops. T-Man's ops had tried to go with the move on him. Failing to crush T-Man, they would delete his partner. It is rumored that the crushing of Jermaine would be in retaliation to this incident. Ish would get real on April 27th of 2000. T-Man and co-defendant Corey Washington would smash Charles Howard, aka Pig, with the bread from the bag that was on Charles' head. They were cop that worked from eyes. T-Man and Corey would allegedly use a 40 and a 45 to carry out the hit. The crushing of Charles would raise their status in the city. On March 2nd of 2003, T-Man would allegedly bang up Chester Smith and Ray Minor. Ray, who will be crushed, was not the intended target. It is rumored that Chester was stepping on T-Man's toes. At approximately 4 a.m., Chester would hear a knock at the door. Upon opening the door, Chester would see that it was a junkie out the hood. Words would be exchanged. The junkie would up a 3-8. A struggle would ensue. In the midst of the struggle, T-Man would pop up in the hallway with a 2-2-3 and start hitting. Chester, who attempted to flee the apartment through the back door, would be hit in the arm. Upon arriving on the scene, the NOPD will find that Ray Miner had been crushed. This is the story of T-Man.
In a decade-long run, the Cut Boys will use intimidation tactics to control the 11-5 trade in the B.W. Cooper Housing Project, a.k.a. the Calio. Derek Ives Washington will become one of the main suppliers, while T-Man will grow his reputation as an enforcer and will be eventually held responsible for three crushings. Following an intense investigation, the FBI would indict 11 Cut Boys under the RICO statute for distribution and crushings. Federal authorities wouldn't be prepared for Hurricane Katrina's catastrophic destruction due to the 2005, which would damage evidence and displace witnesses. The Yo, no stranger to deletions, would be one of the most crucial projects in the city. In 2001, there had been 27 attempted crushings in the Yo. The NOPD would identify T Man as one of the most violent men in the city during his days on the streets. Before Hurricane Katrina, the federal government had allegedly compiled irrefutable evidence against T Man, Eyes, and the infamous Cut Boys. The Big Easy has had traditions beyond Mardi Gras and the French Quarter for decades. The NO would also be recognized as the crushing capital of the world. The Calio has a long history of gangsters, Tony D, Levi, Meatball, Randall Slim, just to name a few. T-Man would be raised in a single-family household without his father. He would come up looking up to steppers and hustlers out the yo. The Calio, built in 1949, would be comprised of 1,546 units on 56 acres of land, which equates to 24 city blocks. All of the projects in NO had a reputation. The Calio, in particular, would be one of the most treacherous. It was in the B.W. Cooper, a.k.a. Calio, where T-Man would earn his reputation. The Rose Tavern has been infamously known for being the spot for that dog food for decades. T-Man would be 17 when he would be caught slipping and get hit in the neck and shoulder. From then on out, T-Man would crush his way into earning his respect. By the 90s, record deletions will be reported coming out of the Crescent City. In broad daylight on Halloween of 1997, T-Man and Adam Cobbins would catch Jermaine slipping in front of Mike's store and crush him. During this time, the Yo had the 11-5 market on lock, having the best dog food in the city at the time. Junkies will come from all over the city to cop out the yo. Don't get it twisted. BTG, Back of Town Gangsters, aka the Cup Boys, weren't to be played with. In 2000, T-Man would take the hit on Charles Howard, aka Pig, who had a bag on his head. T-Man would run Junkie G on Pig, getting him to come hit a lick. When Pig would attempt to climb through the window to pull off the alleged hit, he would be hit up. Pig would be left crushed in the courtyard. In another situation, Chester Smith was pumping on T-Man's turf. Chester would be warned to pay draft or shut it down. In other words, get down or lay down. Refusing to comply, Chester would now be on the list. In the wee wee hours of the morning, T-Man would strike. Using a Vic to gain entry to the apartment, T-Man would start letting off with a 2 2 Three. Ray Miner, who would sleep on the couch, would be crushed. Fleeing out of the back door, Chester would get hit in the arm. T-Man would chase Chester up the street, busting at him with the 223. Needless to say that this would be the end of Chester's career as a hustler in the yo. It wouldn't be long before the NOPD would introduce Safe Home to the streets of the NO in 2001, teaming up with the ATF. The cops would devise a plan. That plan was to become a part of the community. The story goes like this. The number one rule in the street is don't talk to the cops. When it came to the yo, no one would be caught dead talking to the police. It was this fear that the hustlers and steppers would take advantage of. It's a well-known fact that in the Calio, the Cup Boys would do as they pleased. They knew that no one in the hood would come forward as a witness against them. Terrified of the Cup Boys and distrustful of the police, some of the elderly residents of Back of Town would say that they truly felt like prisoners in their own backyards. In November of 2001, police detective Ray Connor and ATL Special Agent Mike Eberhardt would hop in their Silver Crown Victoria and drive up and down back of town. They would make no secret about who they were and why they were there. 
frequently telling the residents that they were there to help them. It is alleged that they would confront the cut boys individually, telling them they were there to lock them up. This aggressive approach wouldn't work as the cut boys would still have a stronghold on the project. The two investigators would go with their next plan. That plan would be to immerse themselves into the community. Their new plan would be simply to show their presence without hacking anyone up. It wouldn't be long before they would be seen, not as cops, not as intruders, but as Ray and Mike. The two would spend nearly every day in the yoke. For months, they wouldn't ask about anything crime related. Little by little, the residents would start to trust them. It would take months, but gradually, the residents of back of town would begin to loosen up and talk. The fear that the residents had would begin to subside. Their trust in Mike and Ray would begin to build. As they would casually cruise the streets of Baggertown, Mike and Ray would begin to notice a change. When driving around, some people would actually wave at them. After a while, they would know almost everything that was going on in the yoke. In their minds, they were in the loop. If something happened, people would low-key call them and let them know. Bit by bit, they would collect a wealth of information about the cut boys and various activities that would take place in the yoke. It was alleged that some residents of back of town had their personal numbers. Mike and Ray would spend all of 2002 rounding up witnesses and collecting cold case evidence from previous crimes that the NOPD had already worked. In the hot summer of 2003, after nearly 20 months, they finally had collected all the evidence they needed to put the cut boys out of business. Six months before Hurricane Katrina, eyes would take a few months after the storm. The feds would now be prepared to take the remaining cup boys to court. By the time jury selections had begun, all but two of the cup boys had taken pleas. T-Man and Woozy would be the last men standing. With the death penalty on the table, T-Man would ultimately take a plea deal. Woozy would take them to trial, be found guilty, and get a life sentence. This was the story of T-Man. The city of New Orleans is divided into 17 wards. Politically, the wards are used in voting and election. Subdivided into precincts, the various starters of the 19th century, aldermen and later city council members were elected by ward. The city has not had officials elected to represent wards since 1912, but the ward designations remain a part of New Orleans fabric. The 8th Ward is a narrow strip stretching from the Mississippi River on the south to Lake Hunter Train in the north. East or down is the 9th Ward. The boundary being Franklin Avenue, Almanasta Avenue, then Peoples Avenue, and a line straight north into the lake at part of the University of New Orleans campus. On the west or upper side, the boundary is Easy Fields. The boundary with the 7th Ward of New Orleans. As with most of New Orleans, the area along natural high ground of the riverfront was developed for urban use first. Other than the narrow high ground of Gentilly Ridge, the majority of the area between Claiborne Avenue and the lake was underdeveloped until improved drainage was initiated at the start of the 20th century. In the 19th century, in the area from Gentilly Ridge to the lake, the People's Avenue Canal formerly stretched along the ward's back boundary with the lower line front of train levee in the back, making it the city limit of New Orleans. Twelve men that were accused of being members of a clique from the 8th Ward called Rather Die were set to be arraigned on Tuesday, September 24, 2013 in federal court. A federal grand jury would hand up the indictment on a Thursday. It would be unsealed that Friday. According to the 20-count indictment, the clique carried four crushings to further its enterprise. The clique slung that girl, green, and that boy in this territory. The indictment would identify that territory as being bounded by North Miro Street, St. Claude Avenue, Elysia Fields Avenue, and Franklin Avenue. Also known as ROD, it is alleged that the clique sought retribution on anyone who showed them or the enterprise any disrespect. They were known for displaying a reckless disregard for life itself. This is the story of the Lloyd Puggy Jones. Alleged members of the clique are as follows. Eloy Puggy Jones, 21, 
Byron, Big Baby Jones, 23, Sydney, Duda Man, Patterson, 22, Irvin, Nurky, Spooner, 25, Romalis, Roro, Parker, 20, Nyson, Nicey Jones, 29, Trey Clemens, 22, Andrelli, Newt, Lewis, 34, Morris, Summers, 22, Tyrone, Burton, aka Peanut, 20, Tyron, Man Man, Burton, 19, and Perry, Yummy Wilson, 22. The indictment is the latest result of work by the MAG unit, which is led by the NOPD. The unit's investigations have led to sprawling racketeering indictments for other cliques, including the Seven World Click, MMG, the One Tenors, Green G, and the Taliban. Prosecutors will seek higher sentences by invoking the RICO Act, aimed at habitual criminals by letting the jury see a pattern of behavior as opposed to isolated incidents. Defense attorneys will say that prosecutors are only trying to bolster cases that were weak and wouldn't stand up without invoking a RICO. They would also complain that the large number of defendants for one case is too burdensome on court systems that are already under intense strain, especially for public defenders. According to the 33-page indictment, the clique leader, Deloitte Puggy Jones, crushed 17-year-old Rodney Coleman on November 9th of 2010 and 22-year-old Devin Hutton on January 17, 2011. Deloitte, Puggy Jones, and Sidney Patterson are charged with crushing 19-year-old Corey Blue on January 18th of 2011. Byron Jones and Sidney Patterson were crushed 30-year-old Travis Arnold on February 24th, 2010. R.O.D. would boast about their acts, taking pictures and videos of themselves with straps. Deloitte, Puggy Jones, who had been in prison serving an 80-year sentence since March 2012, was convicted by a jury in December of 2011, along with Alton Pee Wee Augustine on two counts each of attempted crushings. Prosecutors will claim that they started busing in the 1300 block of Gallier Street, which is home to two alleged members of the G-Strip. This would leave two people injured, including a 78-year-old woman who would be sitting in her kitchen nearby. Delard Jones, aka Puggy, would twice be the city's most wanted man. After spending years in and out of the criminal system, Puggy would be indicted by the Fed. Puggy will be accused of being a part of a criminal enterprise known as Ride or Die. On the street, they were pumping on operating mainly in the Gentilly area. Puggy will be 15 when he will break out of the youth study center. Facing charges, he was considered armed and dangerous. A few months after Puggy turned 17, he will be booked as an adult for busing his gap. NOPD would allege that Puggy popped up a dude on North Roman in 2009. Later that same day, Puggy and another man would get caught up trying to jack a bait car. The bait car would stall, the doors would auto lock by remote control. The NOPD would swoop in. Puggy would eventually be arrested and plead guilty. He would be sentenced to five years suspended sentence, meaning he served no jail time. Just days after being released on a spree in the Ninth Ward, Puggy would allegedly be running through the hood trying to knock off a dude. Puggy would be cowboying, missing his op, hitting occupied home. The DA would refuse the charges. It was rumored that the age of 18, Puggy would pull off an act on Spain Street. A few years later, he would smash someone. In February of 2011, a chase and massive manhunt would lead to Puggy's arrest. A 20-count federal indictment would accuse Puggy of RICO violation. A federal jury would return a guilty verdict against Ride or Die that prosecutors would accuse of illegal activity. Deloitte Jones, aka Puggy, 23, Byron Jones, 24, and Sidney Patterson, 24, would be convicted on numerous counts of RICO violations. The prosecution would allege that they were responsible for going hard in the St. Rock community. The three men would be named in the 2013 federal racketeering indictment. Eight other men would plead guilty. A ninth man would agree to a plea deal in 2014. The loyal Puggy Jones was convicted of 11 of 13 counts. Byron Big Baby Jones was convicted of nine of nine counts. Sidney Dudeman Patterson was convicted of 11 counts, including conspiracy to violate RICO. All three men would face life in prison. As we approach the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, police and prosecutors in the city of New Orleans announced the indictment and convictions of two different the city of New Orleans. We've all heard about the ride or die, big lot of arrests in the last couple of years. Today, numerous convictions. Three of those members were convicted, nine others pled guilty. The U.S. attorney and police chief say this is a step in the right direction to keeping the city of New Orleans safe. Also, 
They indicted numerous members of another known as the YMM. The police chief tells us, like I said, this makes New Orleans safe. What you are witnessing is one team, one fight. There is no light between us. We can't be stopped. We can't even be slowed down. The U.S. attorney for this area, Kenneth Polite, has put an emphasis on cracking down on violence, especially in the streets of New Orleans. Hear what he has to say about this situation coming up at 5 o'clock. For now, reporting on your side in New Orleans, I'm Travers Mackle, WDSU News.